Hi everybody, today we're looking at chapter three, using the internet, making the most of the web's resources. Wow, what can I say about the internet? There's so much. For those of you that have grown up in a world that always had the internet, you probably, and don't take this the wrong way, take it a little bit for granted. I'm not saying that as a criticism at all. It's just, it's always been there for you. But I am from the generation that grew up before even personal computers. I didn't get my first one until I was an adult. And I thought it was amazing. And then when the internet came along, that was even more amazing. And we're talking about the internet at dial-up speeds. So let's talk about a little bit about how it came to be before we get into some of the things that we need to think about today. So the internet first began as a project of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as ARPA, uh, which has morphed eventually into the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA, that uh, people like to, you know, write thriller novels about um, at any rate. Um, the whole point was to develop, to develop a communications method whereby military and scientific research stations could communicate in such a way that um, if a node of the network was taken out, the whole thing wouldn't crash. You see, we're talking about Cold War times. Everybody was concerned about Soviet bombs and, you know, everybody was learning how to duck and cover in elementary school and, you know, ridiculous, useless stuff like that. Um, but the idea for a communications network that was distributed so that messages could go any number of a different number of pathways in order to get to their uh, end point uh, so that if one pathway got knocked out, they could still go another way and the message would get there. That was amazing. Um, and of course, electronic messaging required a coding system in order for uh, electronic signals to be translated into something that we as human beings would understand. So we saw the development of ASCII code. Um, in 1969, the very first message was sent via the network system from um, uh, UCLA to Stanford. And it was very exciting. It was just the word log. Um, it was intended to be the word log on, but it crashed in the middle of the first message. But, you know, when stuff crashes, you turn it off, you turn it back on again and hope it works. Um, this idea of being able to communicate between research stations and universities got really popular and a lot more research facilities and universities wanted in on that. Uh, and, you know, they saw it as a great way to share resources and communicate without people having to travel around a lot. Um, then in 1972, we saw the development of the idea of email. Uh, the uh, host and the user concept so that people could send messages, you know, easily from one to another. Um, in 1973, we saw the development of communication protocols so that our messages could be understood as long as everybody agreed to follow, uh, you know, the same sort of protocols. Um, the, the, the real kicker, of course, in 1991 was when Tim Berners-Lee uh, developed the concept of the HTTP protocol, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and the World Wide Web, the collection of documents that could be looked at and stored on servers, well, stored on servers and then looked at via connections on this amazing internet. And it, it just took off from there. And, um, you know, it became, you know, what we have today, just an enormous network of networks where, you know, everybody is hooked in and everybody can communicate with everybody else. But now the whole thing depends on being able to find the people that you want to find. So everybody hooked into the internet has to have an IP address. IP addresses 
look like this? Well, they did look like that top one, but we ran out of numbers. So now they look like the bottom one. We've gone from the IPv version 4 to the IP version 6. Now that doesn't mean that the IP version 4 ones aren't good anymore. They still are. Um, but since they ran out of ones to assign, we now have the more complicated version 6 ones. Um, but look at those numbers. I mean, can you remember all those numbers in order to get to the site that you want to look at? I know I can't. Um, so while those numbers are still running everything in the background, we have a much simpler way of finding the pages and the documents that you and I want to look at, and that is the domain system, which uses the URL. Now, the domain name is the main site that holds all of the information that you might want to be looking at. And most domain names are followed by a top-level domain indicator like .com, .gov. Um, you know, these indicate a commercial website or a government website. .edu is an educational one. Uh, but before we can get to that, we have to establish the protocol by which we get to that top-level domain. And for most websites that you would want to visit, visit on the World Wide Web, that's going to be Hypertext Transfer Protocol, that HTTP. So we put that first, and then the www to signify that it's a World Wide Web site, then NewYorkTimes.com. After that, we have the path or subdirectory that finds the exact document that we want. Or maybe we just go to the top level domain and use their menu system to find the pages that we want. But this is a lot easier to remember than all of those numbers. I mean, remember that? Yuck. Yeah, nobody wants to remember that. This is so much easier. And most of the times, your browsers will just let you put in nytimes.com. The HTTP full colon slash slash www dot is understood. You know, unless you type in something else. And there are other places you could go. But you know, this makes it a lot easier to find the things that we all want to look at. But of course, it all depends on that protocol. And there are lots of protocols. There's the TCP IP protocol, the uh, hypertext transfer protocol, the simple mail transfer protocol, um, all of these protocols are simply sets of rules that everybody agrees on so that our messages go through. You know, it's like at diplomatic meetings, we have a set of protocols that determine who sits where, who gets to speak first, under what circumstances you can interrupt, and when it's your turn to speak. And we do this so that we don't get into big fist fights instead of, you know, talking about things and getting problems solved. Now, I mean, obviously, we probably still do get into big fist fights and instead of talking about things and getting problems solved. But uh, yeah, but these sets of rules determine how everything happens on the internet so that when we send out messages from one place to another, they get to where they're going to and they make sense when they get there. And that's what all these internet protocols are for. Now, there's something you need to understand about the internet. And that is that the internet is a completely public place. Okay? Nothing is private unless it's severely encrypted. And most people don't bother with that. So, and I realize that people tend to think that, you know, whatever they put out there is just for the people that they want to see it, unless they're, you know, deliberately putting on YouTube and hoping thousands upon millions of people will look at it. Um, but, you know, your text messages, your emails, all of that, there's a limit to the privacy protection that is on stuff like that. So, it's a good rule of thumb to just assume that somebody's going to see anything that you put out there, no matter where you put it. You know, even Snapchat that's supposed to disappear doesn't. 
you know, because there's such a thing as a screen capture. You know, you just want to be very, very careful of what you put out there. Okay. A lot of people share what I think is just a little bit too much. But you know, you're adults, you're entitled to make those choices for yourself. So, yeah. But think about other people that might be looking at what's out there. Uh, now, there are certain measures that we can take to control what our children have access to on the internet. Net Nanny is one of them. I think there's uh, one called Mayberry that um, also has you know good parental controls for what your children are allowed to see when they're browsing the internet. And all of these are good tools to use if we want to protect our children. And we should be protecting our children. So use them. You know, that's what they're out there for. But when you get right down to it, nobody controls what's out there. There's no one agency that controls everything that's on the Internet. Now, there are some countries where the Internet is censored. The U.S. is not one of them. In a way, I think that's a good thing. In a way, maybe it's not such a good thing. The thing is, you just have to be careful. And speaking of being careful, question everything. Okay? And I'm not just talking about if you're doing research for a paper or something like that. Question what you see in people's Twitter posts. Question what you see on TikTok. Question what you see in YouTube videos. Question what you see in Instagram posts. You know, unless it's just you know, a person's specific point of view, if somebody's claiming something is fact, where do they get those facts? What are their sources? How do they back it up? Question everything before you pass on that information as being fact. Okay. Now, it's okay to say, I heard this and this is the source. Yeah. That person could be completely mistaken, but you put it on them, not on you. You know, you don't need to claim something is gospel if you don't know for a fact that it is. So question everything. Okay. The other thing that we want to be careful of, information overload. There's so much out there. You know the, the, the thing that comes up on your phone that tells you your screen time is up this week? Um, well, personally, I resent that because I use my iPad, which you know is considered screen time for all of my recreational reading. And I'm not talking about you know reading TikTok posts and Instagram stuff and all that. I'm talking reading actual books. You know, right now I'm reading one about the last Empress of China in and among several other books. I usually have, you know, three or four books going on at once. So I resent that being counted as screen time. I consider screen time to be time I spend looking up information or looking at social media, media or something like that. Reading to me, that's not screen time. That's just reading. But again, there's just so much out there. And, you know, I'm not trying to tell you what to look at or when to look at, at it or, you know, exactly how much time you should spend on your phones or on your computers looking at social media or looking at whatever it is that you look at. That's entirely up to you because, again, you're adults. You need to make these decisions for yourself. I'm just saying think about how much of that you're looking at and what kind of influence it may be having on you. See, I grew up without all that, and I may have a slightly different sp perspective than you, and we're both entitled to our own points of view. I'm just saying, be careful, because, you know, you want to be well-informed, and you want to be entertained, but you don't want to be bamboozled, and you don't want to be overwhelmed. So, be careful out there, and I'll see you in the next video. Good morning. I wish you could